So welcome everybody to my 34th uh, Talks with Terry. And uh, we are recording this meeting and I'm very happy to have my colleagues, uh, Deloren Carson and June Speakman. And our guest of honor this morning is John Marion from Common Cause. And this morning's, and oh, and uh, Representative Susan Donovan just joined us as well. Thanks, Susan, good morning. And our topic uh, for conversation this morning is uh, the new way that public meetings are being held online. And I'm just wanted to get feedback from John because I know Common Cause has been hosting a series, is, has begun to host a series of meetings on this topic. And uh, June Speakman and Lauren and Susan and I have been uh, discussing how we could learn from what our local towns and boards are doing with online meetings and uh, what are the pitfalls, um, what are the things we are good that we should consider as the General Assembly considers or the House in particular considers moving hearings and maybe our full assembly online. Um, so that's the topic of conversation. And John, would you like to, to start us off with some thoughts? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for, for having me, Terry. Um, so uh, I'm just going to take people back a little bit. So, so you might remember in 2019, URI created an independent board um, separate from the um, State Board of Education. And uh, last fall, President Dooley approached Common Cause because he was trying to recruit national level um, members for that board, but he worried that they wouldn't want to come to Kingston four times a year for board meetings uh, if they were high profile folks. So he wanted to be able to have those meetings online. Uh, and I think uh, President-elect Biden actually appointed one of the URI board members as his, was it like to the Council of Economic Advisors maybe or something last week? So he, obviously President Dooley was successful at recruiting high profile board members. Um, but he approached us because he wanted um, basically a carve out in the state's open meetings law to allow the URI board to meet online from time to time. Uh, the open meetings law uh, doesn't allow uh, public bodies to meet online. Uh, it allows individual members who might be deployed overseas in the military or have uh, certain uh, qualified disability to participate remotely. But to the best of my knowledge, nobody really takes advantage of that. Um, so we looked, we talked to President Dooley and um, looked at sort of how other states allow this, and surprisingly, uh, quite a few states do allow public meetings to be online, um, which I think makes sense. You know, if you're in Texas and you're on the Railroad Commission, you might not want to fly in from El Paso uh, every time there's a meeting uh, in Austin. And so uh, we started to look for sort of what were best practices, and, you know, um, for instance, not letting every meeting be online or requiring a certain part of the public body to be in person um, and, and so forth. Uh, but the URI hadn't introduced a bill, um, but we were gonna support it uh, as an experiment to see how it, how it went. And then the pandemic hit and uh, Governor Raimondo, one of the first executive orders she issued after the pandemic um, uh, lifted the prohibition in the law and electronic meetings, that's what it's called. And um, or it, I think telephonic and electronic meetings. And all of a sudden, everybody was in the deep end of the pool, um, so to speak, trying to figure this out. Um, and so we got together with the ACLU who we'd been discussing the URI bill with uh, and put out some very basic like guidelines you know, wrote a letter to the governor saying, could you please just tell the public bodies if they're gonna do this, you know, make sure the public has access to the Zoom link and make sure that the members of the public body have their camera on, make sure they do uh, roll call votes, not voice votes, because you could see how that could go disastrously wrong uh, on a Zoom call. 
And so uh, her director of department administration kind of put out a memo um, strongly suggesting these things uh, to public bodies. Um, and then over the summer, uh, a group uh, met uh, that is headed out of the Department of Business Regulation. So Governor Raimondo tapped Liz Tanner, who's the head of DBR, um, with helping um, municipalities get online. Uh, and so they used some CARES Act money to buy Zoom accounts for every municipality. They bought a great big Zoom account and told municipalities, if you want a free account, you know, fill out this application and we'll get you a free account. And many municipalities did. Uh, and it's a, a really robust webinar account, not, not to pick on this, this is what I use, but like this is a meeting and it's a webinar. So it can handle 500 people at a time um, and has, has a lot of ability to um, control the audience because, you know, if you're in a public meeting, you can't, you have to worry about people you know, um, Zoom bombing and things like that. And then a, a work group formed out of DBR um, that had some local officials and some uh, uh, town solicitors uh, and some state officials. And they came up actually with a, a guide and I'll put it in the chat before we're done um, to how to hold a public meeting online, both from a technology perspective and a best practices perspective. And that's all great. So this Rhode Island, to the best of my knowledge, that's the only like guide in the country um, so Rhode Island, this is some place we're really leading uh, in terms of getting public bodies up online, holding successful meetings. Of course, you hear about the ones that go disastrously wrong, um, like Providence City Council meetings that get Zoom bombed or Pawtucket City Council meetings. But the vast majority of them have have gone just, just fine. And, uh, but then we started to think, okay, you know, the we being common cause, you know, the ability to have these meetings online only exists because of the state of emergency and the governor's ability to issue an executive order. So what comes after, after the pandemic? Um, and I've been anecdotally hearing from people who like this, right? Who, we wouldn't all necessarily be in a coffee shop this morning doing this um, because you know, there, there's a, a cost to getting out of your house and getting in the car and going to the coffee shop and um, going to the constituent meeting that doesn't exist if you just have to log into a link. Um, so uh, what Common Cause did is we uh, planned an event that we had about a week and a half ago, um, soliciting um, input from the audience. We did a survey of the audience um, and then we had about a hundred people at the event. And then also we asked not subject area experts, but sort of like people who are situated in different positions in the sort of community. So we had a town solicitor, we had a, a school committee chair, but we also had somebody who leads like a parents group um, that goes to school committee meetings. Um, and we had them sort of reflect on, on public meetings more generally, but also um, online. Uh, and then we had three people um, who are more sort of experts who are um, taping a response to that. We're gonna release that next week. Um, and we're trying to um, sort of begin a community dialogue about what public meetings and democracy more broadly should look like after the pandemic. Um, and so uh, I'll put it in the chat, but you can watch the video of that event um, if, if you want to, it's um, online. And, uh, and you can even take the survey if you want, we'll, we'll see the results. Um, but we're gonna present the results of the survey uh, when we release the response videos. Um, which should be as soon as next week. Um, and we have another event um, uh, on Sunday, which is similar, but um, focusing on sort of elections. So that's where we're coming from.
So let me ask you again, John, did you say you, I, I, I looked for that link of the meeting a week ago Sunday because I wanted to send it to my constituents. Yeah. So gonna give, I couldn't find it, but, but I, I just couldn't find it. So you're going to give us that link? Yeah. So I think I try to do two things at once and type in the chat and talk to you. And I think I only sent it to Terry. So I'll figure out what I'm doing yeah, wrong here I wanted, I want, I was going to send that out to people. I, I thought that people really might be interested in seeing it. Yeah, I mean, people seem, people seem, thanks, have, people have an opinion. A lot of people, particularly the people we interact with who are sort of active citizens, um, you know, a, a big goal is to make folks who aren't typically active citizens into active citizens by increasing per access to public meetings. Um, but, you know, there are definitely some pitfalls to these meetings moving online too. So we're trying to kind of um, look at the, the big picture with the goal that there's going to be a piece of legislation eventually, um, you know, and we'll have to, um, it, because there was a bill uh, that we've introduced maybe for four years that was making amendments to the Open Meetings Act, but it was looking at meetings pre-pandemic and thinking it's, it's kind of working around the margins of of how public meetings occurred pre-pandemic. But I think we've had this big sort of disruption with the pandemic and, you know, all of a sudden everything changed. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the really dramatic change. So let's learn those lessons and try to build, build on them. Right. I agree with you. So if the house were to make a rules change that to allow for members to participate remotely, that, rules change would only be valid during this um, is it the emergent the executive order the emergency the state of emergency we're under and then we would have to have a statute change is that so the, my well so the legislature is not subject to the open meetings law oh right so, how convenient um, yeah so, and it's i mean it's a principle of constitutional mm -hmm. law that a legislature can't bind a future legislature um and so you can't pass a rule saying the next general assembly or pass a law saying the next general assembly has to do these things um which you know from a theoretical level makes sense but it makes legislatures look bad because you know that's why the congress for years didn't have sexual harassment laws even though everybody else had to abide by sexual harassment laws because congress couldn't find itself that way. Um, so for the legislature, I th there's a question of like constitutionally, could you meet online? Yeah. And there hasn't been a, a, a real clear answer come from the leadership about, um, about that question. So the Senate has said, we can't meet online as a body as a whole, because of some provisions in the state constitution around quorum um and uh but they haven't really explained that they've just they, they've said that that was the full extent of what they said um they haven't explained in writing why why that is where in other states we've seen either like attorneys general or state supreme courts or you know um the legal departments of the legislature come out with like memos saying here's here's why we can meet online here's why we can't meet online you know um th there's no question i don't think anybody would debate committees can meet online because right. committees are created by the legislature they don't exist in the state constitution you know mm -hmm. um but the body as a whole it's an open question you know so you know um that the legislature says in the constitution has to meet in providence has to be brought into session by the senior member from Newport, um, you know, was part of the compromise from when they decided mm -hmm. that Providence would be the capital after the capitals used to rotate among the five or six state houses. Um, like, what does that mean for, for meeting online? Does that mean the Zoom link has to originate in Providence? You know, does it mean a majority of you have to physically be in Providence? Those are unexplored questions. Right. We have heard those are all questions, but we haven't really gotten answers 
either. Yeah, so. I've written letters to the speaker saying, please explain why you can't meet online and no answer. Well, some of our colleagues are looking into that. Yeah, it's With good. And it seems like there's a, as January rapidly approaches, there's a change in attitude that people realize. Well, I mean, so the Senate's going to meet over at Rhode Island College. Right. Like they're trying to come up with creative solutions. So. Well, we'll be meeting next week at the vet to approve the budget. Yeah. The 2021 budget. And we're under the impression that at a minimum that we will have to have the inauguration in person. Mm -hmm. Although now I've seen uh, just this week, Portsmouth uh, swore in all their new town councilors and school committee members online. Go to Newport. But so we're, but we're under the impression, um, my colleagues on this call, that we're gonna be in person for that in January mm -hmm. and, um, and then maybe we would have to come back in person one more time to vote on the rules. And then the rules, perhaps during this period of time anyway, would allow at least a portion of the body to be remote. And I guess that's where we're, there's open-ended questions whether the quorum has to be present in Providence or not. Am I explaining that yeah. the way you in, ex, understand it, ladies? <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly right. Yeah, because the language in the Constitution, it talks about the legislature convening in Providence. But it, right. could it convene? Yeah, convene on the first day and then. What's the gather. definition of convene? <laughs> what does that yeah. mean? Right. Yep. Yeah, so um, from what I know, they're finally looking nine months into the pandemic at sort of the legal legal questions about what well, can and can't be done john. but there's been some changes john there's yes there's been ideas. some changes yes <laughs> new ideas so, i understand yes. and which speaker um, are you writing to <laughs> yeah yeah i have not written a letter to the new speaker so well he's not he's on speaker it. yet so he's yeah. on it um yeah yeah but i mean you know certainly i'm sure once the pandemic's over the legislature will go back to meeting in person. But I think there is a question, will school committees and city councils and planning boards and everybody else go back to meeting in person? And I, I think there are folks who are gonna argue that they shouldn't because it it provides this, you know, the ability, the accessibility, but others are gonna argue that, you know, we've lost something by not gathering in person. Um, and, you know, there are valid arguments on both sides. So it'll be a policy decision of the General Assembly what to allow. But we have a lot of data now and experience from people um, who've been to online public meetings and can point out things they like and don't like about, about the experience. Could there be, John, a, um, a, a hybrid where, after the pandemic, where the decision makers, uh, unless they can't make it, are there in person and members of the public who choose to attend in person, but then you have a Zoom audience or a remote audience, whether it's Zoom or something else, um, and you alternate between, this is, I've been teaching this way for the past semester, mm -hmm. and you alternate between uh, involving online and physically present members of the public in question testimony, things like that. Yeah, and that seems to be splitting the baby, so to speak. The biggest hurdle would be the technology. And so I don't know if anybody's been to a hybrid meeting that has been disastrous, but some are terrible. They're, you know, it's, there's only one camera for the whole public body and one microphone and you can't hear anybody, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. you know, uh, so what I would like to see is if we're going to allow something like that, you have to have some standards, right? So you have to say, if you're going to allow remote access, particularly if you're going to allow any member of the public body to be remote, you have to have a, a basic level of, of technology. Um, one of the arguments we had been pushing prior to the pandemic, we had a bill that would simply have required cities and towns to live stream 
like mm -hmm. set up a camera and just live stream, no interactive. And they, you know, complained a lot about cost. Um, and we pushed back and said, it's really not like the, the League of Cities and Towns sort of got them all ginned up about making them think they had to create a TV studio to do this. And I was talking like, put a camera on a book, you know, <laughs> press, you know, Facebook Live or whatever, and just, just a static shot. Um, and that doesn't really have any true cost. Um, and what I think the pandemic has taught is these technologies can be done pretty cheaply. It can be done pretty well, pretty cheaply. What have you seen as the biggest, um, other than the Zoom bombing, which um, I've seen, I saw at the very beginning on a couple of meetings, um, but what what else? And I did participate in your um, your forum last week, um, but what else came up? I'm trying to recall what some of the people on that call on that um, at that meeting were saying as the challenges, the pitfalls if you will. Yeah, so the the um, challenges seem to be the biggest one I think people pointed out is you lose sort of a human element to a yes. meeting. So um, he wasn't at our event, but I talked to Steve Alquist, who a lot of us know, um, and he talked about like when they were fighting the power plant in Burville, how the audience like that was an organizing opportunity for the audience. They were making connections, you know, sort of mm -hmm. self-identifying as in opposition to the power plant. And there was a benefit to that. So, you know, he was arguing against like fully remote forever. He thinks you gotta allow people who wanna be in the room, you allow them to be in the room because there's a benefit to them. The reporter who was on our webinar, Steph Machado said, you know, a reporter can't chase the school committee chair down the hall asking for a comment about the controversial vote if they can just close the Zoom link. Um, and I've heard that from other other reporters. I've seen Kathy Gregg at the end of the Ethics Commission meeting, like unmute herself and just start screaming. Mm -hmm. um, don't hang up, don't hang up. Um, so, uh, you know, you lose that you know, a, an opportunity to talk to your elected or appointed officials, um, but you gain, you know, the, just volume of people. Like there's a lot more people going to public meetings. I go to public meetings professionally and I was often the only person in the audience at some of these meetings and now there are 20 to 30 people at every meeting right. because mm -hmm. the cost of attending has gone down. Um, it's a, it's not as good of an experience as when I was there and I could harangue the, mm -hmm. the chair for something, but, um, but it's certainly, I'm glad there's 30 other sets of eyes on that public body. So how do you, you know, how do you recreate the in-person experience or preserve it? but also not lose the access is the trade-off. Right. I, I, as an observer to say a town council meeting, which I have been attending probably a lot more than, <laughs> and some nights I have, since I'm representing two towns, sometimes they have <laughs> their meetings at the same time. And that's challenging trying to listen to two different meetings, but I have tried. Um, but uh, I do miss, like not knowing as the observer, um, I miss not knowing who else is in the room with you, who else that that's the one thing I have like today, we can all see who's on this call with us. But with the the zoom uh, uh, program that the uh, the councils and school committees yeah. are using, you don't see you don't have that level of transparency so you don't know who else i think the council members do yeah but, um the public doesn't know who else is with them and that's the difference between the so somebody asked about webinar versus meeting so if this is a meeting any of you can unmute yourself turn your camera on and speak 
And it's very difficult for the person running the meeting to prevent that. So it's kind of whack-a-mole um, is what I liken it to. But a webinar, those who are speaking are, are participants and everyone else is the audience. And as you said, the audience can't see each other and know who else is in the room. Um, I would imagine that the technology is gonna evolve. So we will get to the point where there will be specific products created for public bodies that will allow maybe the, that'll be an option. You can turn it on so the audience can see each other um, or at least who's, who's in the room, if not their physical camera on. Um, I, because, you know, Zoom is obviously, Zoom webinars weren't made for public meetings. They were made for, you know, presentations. Um, and Zoom meetings weren't made for public meetings. They were made for business. Um, you know, one of the benefits, my organization is distributed. We have chapters in 38 states. So we did a lot on Zoom um, prior to the pandemic. And so we were well situated to kind of give some advice because we'd been holding Zoom meetings for years. Um, when what I found was most, I, I was surprised how many attorneys I'd met had never ever been on a Zoom because everything in the law had to be done in person. Um, and so they really struggled with it. But now the courts have success, largely successfully adapted. You know, they're, they're holding hearings on using WebEx. Um, you know, the executive has largely adapted. It's the legislature who's the, the last to adapt. trying to look at other questions so sort of yeah, yeah. good morning my name morning. is Tina Zelensky many of you may know me and some of you don't good I just idea. want to let you know that I'll be representing ARP um, I am the chair of legislation there in the state and oh, wow. we also have a new director so if you're interested in meeting him his name is Matt Nitto and he has a lot of really great ideas but I know some of you and maybe some of you know me as well, but uh, this is very interesting and I plan to be here, Terry, as much as I can. So thank you very much. Oh, great. No yeah. questions though, okay. Tia. This oh, no, I, well, my yeah. question is how can I get all these Zooms in together? Because I have another one in five yeah. minutes. Ah, wow. well, oh, sometimes thank you very much. See you're you welcome. Time. It, it's good to register because then you often get a link to the recording afterwards mm -hmm. too um and so that's that's something that i've makes you, you can kind of go back and watch you can't be a participant but you can at least observe what other people were saying and thinking yeah and, and it's good to know i know john retired from aarp right Oh, you're muted, you're muted. Tia. Can you un unmute her, Donna? See, I mean, oh. I, said, I certainly give you the information, you know, um, of his new address. He has all kinds of different ideas, which I think would be phenomenal and much more outreach personally to the to the areas, um, say Portsmouth and Newport, and not just to the legislature. So. Um, I'll be in touch and I'll give whoever wants the information, I'll, I'll, I'll get it out uh, so you can reach him yourself. So Actually, he contacted us. I think that there's a web, yeah. there's a Zoom meeting on Friday morning with him, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I don't know if you know about that, Terry. You know, you I do know, know about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think it's for, I think it's for Tia. <laughs> um, oh, yes, I'm aware. I'll see you soon online. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And John? John, thank Terry. you very much. Really yeah, interesting. of course. I'll see you guys. Bye bye. Tia, Bye. Tia, Tia, can you put your uh, contact information in the chat, please? We've had a couple of requests for it. Sure. Okay, I will. Great. Thank you, Tia. And, and Terry, we do have two people who in chat who have multiple questions. Chip is one okay. of them, and then John is next. Chip, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Well, nice to see everyone. A um, couple of comments. Um, as you know, uh, this technology has been around for 20 plus years. So it's in corporate and government, it's, it's very common. It's been around forever. And my issue is a couple of things. There's the, the technology issue. So creating the standards policy procedure at a federal and state level regarding open meetings. So we are really seeing a paradigm shift in our society and in our culture. And I believe it's a requirement that these technologies be enabled, they be funded, and then they be promoted to all, you know, all voters, everyone in of your constituents and to increase engagement. And so some of the technical issues around that, and I'm a big proponent for um, syndication versus, you know, committee, executive open meeting versus public meetings in there. So there are tools and technologies out there that in effect, if Terry has promoted this particular meeting and she is the host and sponsor, other people do not need to be the hosts and sponsors to share and invite other participants. But the difference is, is between meeting versus the webinar. So I just want to bring up, you know, that's sort of one or two of those big issues that I believe that going forward, as John indicated, this is extremely low cost, but I think many of the municipalities have been technology averse or behind, you know, in a lot of their investment in there. And then it's a staffing thing too. So um, a, a member of this meeting today, friends of Terry Court, Court of, and I'm not sure who that is, but you have to have a, a technical moderator or mediator um, you know, on these meetings. So this is the meeting where you sort of control the flow of information, who's asking those questions. Um, so I'm thinking of those are the main sort of questions that I propose. Oh, one other one that I would like to see, and, and I've been doing this stuff for 20 years, but I would envision at some point that there would be a closed caption um, transcription stream at the bottom of these meetings. So look at people that you know are non-English speaking. They would like to participate. It's a public meeting, but the same way you know we sort of talk into our phones now when we use Alexa and Siri, that you know real-time sort of transcription service. That's really evolved. So as I'm speaking, you would then see a closed caption across the bottom, and you would have a language option there also. So I think all these technical issues and these types of things can be built in to accommodate that, but. I think this must be a hybrid, it must be funded, it must be implemented, standardized, promoted, legislated, and then made available going forward. So I don't know if um, any of the uh, legislators, uh, our, our representatives that are on the call today would comment about maybe where that is, if Lauren or Terry would, would comment about your vision for this. Thanks. Um, well, let me, let me, I wanted to make some comments. Um, and uh, June Speakman, who's on this call, who represents part of Bristol and Warren for the Aquidneck Island folks, and Terry and I had been, at the request of the speaker elect, had been looking into uh, both uh, offsite meetings that are safe from the virus, as well as some remote questions. And I wanted to just share with John, which I'm sure he will relate to all these things. It's really going to change the way we work if we go remotely. I mean, in fact, in, in preparing the memo for the new leadership of the House, I made a list of what I called like cultural, traditional things that we do in person that we're not going to be able to do online. Like, for example, sometimes we pass a resolution honoring someone and we put the resolution on the desk for people to physically walk up and sign it. We're not going to be able to do that anymore. Uh, we bring guests into the chamber and introduce them to the chamber. Maybe we recognize a Boy Scout troop or we recognize a basketball team or we recognize a retiring fire chief. We're not going to be able to, we're going to have to figure out how to do that differently. Uh, we walk around the chamber and we ask our colleagues to co-sponsor our bills. If I have a bill that comes up from ledge council and I think June's interested in it, I walk over to June and she signs her name. We're not going to be able to do that anymore. Uh, if I have a bill that I want to share with somebody in the Senate side, I walk over to the Senate and I ask them to do it and we're not going to be able to do that anymore. So there's a series of sort of behavioral changes that have to be made. And you can imagine that those kinds of changes are institutional and are hard to change, right? Particularly with older, more tenured, uh, not older, but more tenured members who've been behaving in certain ways there, say 10 or 20 years. The other issue that I'm concerned about is sort of um, acclimating the freshmen 
because the freshmen are, are don't know what goes on. They don't know us. You know, some of us do outreach to freshmen, and we have about 15 incoming freshmen. They're going to be sitting, you know, at their desk in their house watching, you know, and their and, and their capacity to interact and learn and go on to bills and speak to people is going to be limited. So there are some. I I'm I don't think those are insurmountable. I think that they are things that we don't we take for granted because we work in that room you know 100 days a year i don't i wanted to share that with you john i don't know if you have any comments on that you know you you're an observer in the room all the time and so those are things that we have to uh work around you know really work yeah. around even uh members of the public that choose to come and mm. they might come to the room to talk to one person but then you know they have the opportunity to talk to 20 people and just right. the time investment of right. uh, the time, having right. to pick up the phone and now have individual conversations with all these individuals. I mean, quite frankly, it's going to make I'm, it's going to make a whole lot of work for us because on any given day when we're meeting, say there's a hundred people in the room that want to talk to us about bills. Let's just say that. I'm going to get a hundred emails a day. I mean, that's going to be like insurmountable for me to follow up on. So I don't know what to do about those things yet, but we're yeah. thinking about them. Yeah, um, this is Judy Jones. I spent a lot of time in the uh, up at the state house lobbying on behalf of Rhode Island housing and affordable housing. And then I just started to think about as a lobbyist, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we would hang out trying to, you know, find people that we needed to talk to and so forth. And just what um, Lauren has been saying um, if everything is remote, that sort of changes the whole way that people who um, are um, paid lobbyists as well as citizens would have to figure out how to interact. Sure. Um, so, um, and John, you would understand that <laughs> as well. So, um, yeah, it's very, when you start to peel the onion, you know, and there's all of these layers into, you um, to try and think about a system that makes things more inclusive in some ways, and yet um, puts barriers up in other ways. Yeah, I, I wanna acknowledge, Chip made some great points, particularly the last ones about translation and um, closed captioning. Those are, so we had our event last week simultaneously interpreted, it cost about a hundred bucks. Right. There was a there's a firm, the woman's in Central Falls. She had a Spanish channel. You could press the Spanish button if you wanted to, and you could listen to her simultaneously interpret the event for about a hundred bucks. Um, it costs us for an hour, about an hour and a half of her time. Um, you know, that's not you know, that that drastically increases the audience uh, in a lot of communities. Um, same with closed captioning. Um, so the technology, I think, can really, on some accessibility issues, be, um, be you know, uh, a, a drastic improvement. Um, and it would be nice. I don't, you know, cities and towns are going to complain about unfunded mandates. Um, if if you say you have to do all of these different things, but you know, there might be a way to structure it as sort of a, they get some sort of reward for being more accessible. Um, but certainly at this point, we're just trying to make them aware that the option exists, not, not impose a mandate on them. Um, but to the point about the legislature, you know, I think there, there's this, really you know the legislature for me i want to see like a lot of people said let's build back better after the pandemic the legislative process has always been a bit of a like a mess let's be honest right like overlapping committee hearings that occur at the same time you know we've all testified at committee hearings where the room is full of um, people testifying, but there's nobody up at the dais because everybody left for either for another committee meeting or for a fundraiser. Um, and like, 
I would love not to just think, how do we recreate the in-person experience online? The in-person experience wasn't working, I would submit. And so let's build an online experience that is better than the in-person experience, right? Let's not have overlapping committee meetings. Like, I don't, I don't have a solution for how you do that, but I know every other state legislature seems to manage to do that to some degree. Um, let's not, you know, have people wait five hours for the committee hearing to start because the, it was posted at the rise and not know if their bill is going to get taken first, even though it's first on the agenda, but they, you know, it, it gets taken up 22nd. Um, th th these are things that, these are solvable problems. And so I would like to see the legislature take the opportunity to say, hey, we're redoing all these other things about technology. Let's redo some of these structural things. And I think to Lauren's point about there's a lot, you know, a lot of this is cultural, right? It's today's Greek Independence Day. We're going to spend an hour and a half hearing from speakers about the wonderful Greek culture in Rhode Island. And that's great. But um, you, you've got a couple thousand people waiting in hearing rooms while you're doing this. So like, let's build, like, you could still have Greek Independence Day and do that, but like, you know, l l let's be honest with people. Committee hearings will start at 6.30, you know, like, and let's make sure the Greek Independence Ceremony gets done by, by 6, 6.30. I think if, use the disruption created by this to sort of force some change that otherwise would have been really hard culturally would be the way I would put it. Easy for me to say, I don't have to try to do, you know, get my peers who've been celebrating Greek Independence Day for 30 years to suddenly give it up or make it short or, or whatever. E you and I had a uh, a conversation a couple of weeks ago. Um, could and you were talking about how you how other state legislatures uh, in their hearing process in particular uh, work. Could could you share a little bit of what you shared with me that day um, about how um, testimonies given and. Um, you know, the bill sponsors, how it differs from what yeah. we do in Rhode Island. Yeah, and we're, in, some of you may have experience in other states, but we're somewhat of an outlier in that our legislative hearings are open mic nights for the audience. So mo many are, are closer to what the congressional model people are familiar with, where the witnesses are invited to testify rather than you just sign up to testify. I'm not advocating that. Like the public should have access to the legislature um, and be able to testify on bills. But um, I was talking to my colleague in Illinois two days ago mm -hmm. and he was explaining, you know, so they're, they're sort of a middle, middle route, which is that the legislator has to sort of um, submit a witness list. They could submit as many as they want, but the member of the public has to find a legislator to basically sponsor them to go talk about the bill. Um, I'm not advocating that. We don't have a position on this, but like, mm -hmm. I think we need to kind of look at other states where legislative hearings are far more orderly. Um, and we've created incentives in Rhode Island um, because there's no limit on the number of bills you can put in for legislators to put in a lot of bills that they know will never go anywhere, have hearings on them. The legislators oftentimes, present company excluded, there are certain legislators who don't show up for their own bills, but members of the public see it, they show up, you know, they, they take the floor and, and testify. And it all just feels sort of performative and not very, functional in any respect. Um, and there's a way, there might be ways to, to change that to make it more, more functional without removing the public's right to, to testify. Um, I don't have the answer, but I just, 
I think we need to kind of question the assumption that our model is a is the best model. I think there are probably other models that work better for both the the legislature and the public. Because if the legislators aren't there to hear the testimony, like what's the point of the testimony happening? That that's you're testifying to the committee, not to to other people in the room who are supportive or opposed to the same bill. June, Lauren, mm -hmm. Susan, any of you have thoughts on that in particular? I think uh, it deserves our attention. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I just finished my first session, such as it was, and uh, the I was shocked at the committee hearings, how uh, poorly attended they are by my colleagues. And then when you have, with all due respect to the public, when you hear the same statement for the 20th time, even an attentive member gets exhausted. We're there at 10 o'clock at night. I understand the public has been waiting for a long time too. But you know, when, when, when the 20th person comes up and says this, and most chairs say, if you have, unless you have something new to say, please don't say it, but folks have been waiting for four hours. So they wanna say what their piece. And so I, I do hope that we can find a way that does those two conflicting things, which is to make the hearings more productive have members in attendance, but also give the public the full ability to participate. I'm not sure how you do that, but I, I'm, I imagine that there, there are better ways to do it than we do it. So thanks for, for bringing that up. And John, uh, folks are thinking about these things right now, right? I mean, all the, the four reps on the call think about this and talk about this frequently. Uh, the solution is a different issue, but the conversations yeah. are going on. Yes, so, and thanks for helping us and, think through Yeah, it. no, and that's it's great because I think for too many years it was really nibbling at the margins and not um, thinking about just questioning the assumptions. Well, I also think, and John alluded to this, that committee hearings are different than House sessions, right? Because House yeah. sessions are fundamentally elected with staff in the room debating bills. Committee meetings are public interaction and other things going on. And so an idea of Terry's, which I'll let her speak about if she wants, was that we also need a way to archive electronically the testimony so that we who are either not in the room at the time or are not on the committee can go back and read it. You know, and Terry's been advocating for that for a while. So as part, you know, I sometimes a bill comes up, I don't sit on the committee. I don't know who's even testified on it unless I go to the clerk and physically get pieces of paper from them and read through them. You know, they should be archived so that I could pull up the committee hearing for February 7th and the bills were heard and then you go to the testimony and then right. I can learn about that stuff. So I know Terry's advocated that and I'm a big fan of that. Big Links thing. to the hearings with right. the bill, like the whole bill tracker on the website right. could be updated with um, the links and the testimony. So as a legislator, you could go and do your research all um, efficiently all in one place and not have to go, you know, all over the place. And, and as a legislator, I might never know that mm -hmm. my constituents have shown up to testify on a particular bill. And that's another thing that I think would be helpful for all of us if our constituents to know that our constituents um, have, you know, a feeling one way or the other. Well, also, there are, there are products finance, out there. Sorry. Didn't fi excuse me, June. Didn't finance start doing that this summer, putting testimony online? Um, they yeah. call, right? Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah so, so we're starting to see, yeah, I think maybe some of the Senate committees have, but it's done in a really technologically, like, backwards. It's like a hyperlink to a PDF that's yeah, been, yeah. Yeah. like, there are there are ways to do this, but they they need to redo the the architect you know the infrastructure. Um, so you know eight or seven or eight years ago, Capital TV was run using the original cameras they bought in the eighties, right? And there was a guy in the balcony, and it was like you know um, running this huge old Sony camera, and they invested in the new digital TV technology. And now you can, there's archived hearings and it's great, um, you know, but they had to spend a couple million bucks to kind of redo the guts of the building to do that. The same has to happen with the website. They, but they, you know, theoretically 
capital TV, you could hyperlink to where in the video, the bill comes up in, you know, if you look at other states, you see the bill, you press the button, there's the travel of the bill. So everything that happened to the bill, and you can even press like, and here's where the testimony starts and the video comes up and there's the testimony of the exactly. bill. There's all the, the test testimony, written testimony. That's all very doable. There are companies who specialize in, in only that, right? So um, when the legislature came back and spent the 166,000 on the plexiglass, I, I made some comments to one of the media outlets about this money would be better spent on technology to meet remotely. Um, and on LinkedIn, apparently there's a company who only yeah. specializes in the technology and the guy like the president of the company like saw the saw the TV clip and he linked in me and was like, oh, we provide Massachusetts and Maine's technology. So, I mean, there are companies out there chomping at the bit mm -hmm. to do this. You know, we've got, yeah, I have a couple, a little list. It's, it's not a very long list, but I have a, a list of some of those companies and that ever, Everlast, I think uh, might've been the name of the company that you're talking about. I think um, there are a think couple, they have talent. legislative workflow, it, yeah. Yeah. right? Le where from the very beginning, all the things that Lauren was talking about with regard to getting people's signatures, you can, you can sponsor a bill by clicking a button instead of going running around the chamber to find people. And it, it's, it's all in a box from start to finish, legislative work pro programs that other and states use. If sometimes um, I might be asked, um, uh, how come you didn't sponsor mm -hmm. such and such a bill? And it might just be that it traveled around the other side of the room right. and I never even knew uh, it was introduced until right. after the fact. So having a way that you, mm -hmm. as a legislator, you could add your name to a bill, act, you know, upon maybe within the great. first five days of introduction or something, um, I think that would be another um, piece of, you know, something that better technology would enable us to do, be a new, a new cultural switch, uh, shift that would be positive. Um, Harry. John has and been John, sitting in the queue. Yes, I was just going to ask. I was just thinking the mm -hmm. same thing. You read my mind. Did you, Ms. John Hirschbach, did you have a question? Uh, you pretty much addressed it. That really has to do with uh, John's reference to uh, other states and state of the art uh, open meeting technology that allows uh, legal votes to be taken. Um, it seems like everyone has their finger on some of these solutions. I guess the challenge now is to put it together and, and let's do something uh, rather than be here in another two years, still zooming with one another, wondering why nothing's changed. So, well, what I'm afraid of is that we're going to come up, we're going to overcome the pandemic and we're just going to go back to business as usual, Right, right. you right. know, and that, and mm -hmm. I, I'm an advocate of really assessing what we've learned from this pandemic so that we can actually maybe make some concrete changes. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I really am. I think that'll be the easy way out. You know? Yeah. And I think we'll see that manifested in lots of study commissions. I was, Rather than making hard decisions, it'll be like, well, we'll, we'll pass a study commission. And then by the time the study commission is done, the pandemic's over and you lose momentum for change. So the hope is that change happens in the next six months. Right. Um, we hear you. Will you be, um, you referenced uh, maybe having a bill. Is that something that you all might consider doing? So um, with respect to the Open Meetings Act, I would, as I said, we had a bill for a couple of years. It was mostly about legal changes pre-pandemic. Uh, I'm not too far down the road um, toward having a bill. Uh, but yeah, I would aspire to have one. I won't have one in January. We'll have a bill on voting changes. That's what I'm working on now um, because I think there's, there, there like has to be changes to the voting laws now. Um, we, we did a bunch of stuff um, and there's gonna be a lot of attention on that. There's groups coming in from outside the state to work on voting uh, and so forth. The open meetings one is more, um, I think it's gonna take longer, but yeah, I hope to have a bill, but I hope it's 
what I'm trying to do is gather consensus first rather than do the like, well, here's, let me push the envelope. Here's what we think. I'd rather kind of hear what everybody thinks and everybody comes together in a bill. Um, I don't know if that's going to be possible. And the people, you know, the, the, the big players here are the, the cities and towns, right? So the clerks um, in, the, in the 39 cities and towns who are going to have to, you know, they're the ones who run the vast majority of public meetings, as well as usually the department administration is very interested because there's a lot of public bodies, um, state public bodies that they have to run. Um, but the pandemic has really shifted people's thinking about having online meetings. So I think there will be some version of that. Um, and, I, and Liz Tanner from DVR, who I think has the governor's ear, is going to be very, um, I don't know if she'll come out with a bill, but, but she's going to want to push. Um, and I think she's a very persuasive person um, in the administration. Thank you. But for us, it's more about rules changes than it is about legislation, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I, in my mind, like, these are two very separate topics, um, because the legislature is such a unique creature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, has these constraints by the Constitution, has cultural, you know, history, versus like, the literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of public bodies in every city and town who all have to obey this one sort of script that comes out of the Open Meetings Act. You know, the, the school committee meeting in Woonsocket looks very similar to the school committee meeting in Westerly because they're all following a script created by the Open Meetings Law. And so mm -hmm. what does that script look like? Um, you know, we're basically gonna try to change that script um, and what I'm interested in is, I didn't think the script worked that well prior to the pandemic, right? Like lots of people walk away from the school committee meeting mad because it, like, it's not as much a discussion as it is like this opportunity for a clash. Like it's, okay, we're gonna do a bunch of business. You can't talk, then we're gonna let you turn on the microphone, let you talk, you can vent, but we're not gonna deal with any of that stuff and then we're gonna go home. And it was a recipe for sort of people to be frustrated. So is there a way, I don't know if there is, that using technology, we can make it a more sort of satisfactory experience both for the public body and, and the public. Um, I'm not sure I've, I've seen how that, that can be through technology, but I'm hopeful there can be. But I'll give an example, like the chat, you know, how does the law treat the chat? You know, I find in many of these that I attend, a lot of the valuable discussion is happening in the chat on the side. Like, can we have that? Like at a, at a school committee meeting, mm -hmm. is that chat part of the minutes? Like, is that chat you know, a, a record, you know, th these are questions we have to, to, to answer. Somebody said like the town council just got sworn in on Zoom. Is that even legal? That's an unsettled, from what I've taught, the lawyers I've talked to, they're not sure you can necessarily swear people in online, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so let's, you know, that, I think that's like an easy one. You just put that in the law, you can, you know, things that can happen in public meetings virtually include swearing people, swearing people in. But I, the harder ones are like the chat, you know, the, the, how, do, how does the technology uh, mesh with the law there? Actually, as somebody who sat on a school committee um, for years, over that, I think a 12 year period of time, uh, I saw the open meetings law get stricter and at one time we used to have a um many years ago you'd have a you know an open come to the podium open comment for the public 
and the school committee would engage, but the open meetings law, every time we went to Roger Williams for one of those um, uh, trainings, they got stricter and stricter uh, telling you that you could mm -hmm. not engage on anything that wasn't, I mean, even the um, chair or the superintendent's remarks had to all be pre um scripted in the agenda basically so if something happened yesterday after the agenda went out you couldn't even really talk about it in just conversationally um according to a very strict interpretation of the open meetings law yeah i mean and there's a reason as the open government advocate i'll say there's a reason for that strict interpretation which is you people deserve notice about what the public body is going to be talking about and if they start going off topic then they you didn't sure. get the notice but um there's a um, a national group called the i think it's the national civic league they have a model open meetings law that does it has two types it has a meeting and then it has uh, allows for a second type of event where decisions aren't made but the um agenda is fluid and so it would allow for instance at a public meeting to have like breakout groups ah. you know um and as and as long as no decisions are made you know that's allowed um and as long as the public's notified that this is not a meeting it's this other type of event um and i think you know so i'm i've been looking at that like there are there might be ways to use the law to say to create some space for discussion and deliberation right. um that now how that meshes with technology i don't know but um that model law was written pre pre-pandemic but trying mm -hmm. to create some space for for deliberation without removing the public you know public access on decision making yeah that makes sense it's um as we come to we're at 1002 so this has been a very engaging topic um does anybody else um on on the call have a question before we before we close and i thank you all for um for joining us this morning thank you jerry for organizing this and Don. yeah thank you this is really great thank you <laughs> yeah no, thank, thank you, you Jerry. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. And, um We've recorded this, so I'll have a link up to it that we can share out with our constituents as well. And um, so thank you all.